I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. We're so happy to have all of you here. Uh, I'm Danielle Hicks, Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Tonight, as you know, um, we're going to be talking about maintaining quality of life while living with lung cancer. Our excellent speakers are Jason Morrow, who's an RN, BSN, OCN. He's nursing supervisor, oncology, rehabilitation, and lymphedema management. Prisma Health Cancer Institute Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship in South Carolina. So welcome to Jason. We also have our very own Susan Smedley, BSW. She's a manager of community and endurance fundraising here at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Susan is a lung cancer survivor and a 200 RYT Yoga 4 cancer certified instructor. Uh, and she's coming to us from Colorado tonight. So welcome to both of you. So tonight, just to give you a little brief overview of what we're going to be talking about, you know, what does it mean to you to have a good quality of life post-diagnosis? Stress, anxiety, scanxiety, and side effects can all uh, have impact on the quality of your day-to-day -to -day life. Tonight, we're going to hear from these two experts in the field of rehabilitation and survivorship. Uh, quality of life is not just what your scans say. Your doctors, as you know, focus on the disease, but what we're going to be focusing on tonight is taking care of the person behind the disease, taking back control where you can, and hopefully giving you the tools uh, that you need to do it. Can we talk a little bit about what integrative oncology and survivorship mean? When I think about integrative medicine or the word integrative, I think about evidence-based practices um, come to mind you know, to use in the oncology arena. Um, survivorship, of course, um, you know, we think of survivors, you know, as being uh, anyone from their point of diagnosis, you know, through their cancer trajectory. So just using those evidence-based practices uh, in the oncology arena. So Jason, when you say, just for, for the benefit of our viewers, when you say evidence-based practices, what, what do you mean? Anything like yoga, uh, tai chi, um, meditation, but also um, Rehabilitation, physical therapy, um, psychosocial therapy, sexual health, just all these uh, evidence-based practices that uh, you could use in the therapy for cancer. That's great. Um, so over at Prisma Health, what does a typical day look like for you there? Um, can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about your moving on program? Yep. So our program has been around since about 1991 or 92. Uh, it is actually a free program for our cancer survivors funded through philanthropy. The patients do come in and they're assessed by an re oncology rehab nurse practitioner. Um, that visit is billed to insurance just like a routine office visit if they were seeing their primary oncologist. So we ask them to come for that pre-visit, the post-visit, um, and essentially what the visits are for. The pre-visit is to assess them and make sure that they are appropriate for the gym. Um, and then the post visit is after to kind of see the effects and also try to keep them engaged um, in therapy um, and rehab. So um, the actual program we have is nurse and trainer led. Um, well, it was prior to COVID. Now we've gone just to the exercise trainers, but a 12 week program following the American uh, College of Sports Medicine guidelines for exercise, 150 minutes of aerobic activity a week two weight training uh, sessions a week um, with the certified exercise trainers. So before a patient sort of gets started in, in this type of therapy or program, um, mm -hmm. obviously you touched on it a little bit. There's an assessment or a visit that happens first to gauge a where the patient might be needing the most support and um, then B, whether or not they qualify for that. And I know when we talked about this, you know, a, a week or two ago prior to this meeting, lung cancer patients have a, a very, you know, um, special set of issues when it comes mm -hmm. to um, um, their, their lung capacity. 
So what are some of the common symptoms that are discussed at a first visit? So typically when patients come in, we perform what's called a timed up and go, just a standard test that most, say, physical therapists use, and that's a good measure of balance. We also do what's called a six-minute walk test. Um, if patients can't complete either of those, you know, one, they're too unstable um, or they're not really fit for the gym. If you can't walk, you know, at a brisk pace for six minutes, you can't go to the gym and work out for close to an hour. Um, there's also a physical assessment that's done by the nurse practitioner. Kind of think of a routine physical, you know, just checking range of motion, um, listen to heart and lungs, things like that. We do actually uh, perform what's called a brief fatigue inventory. Where we're asking the patients, so on a scale of zero to 10, zero being no fatigue, 10 being the worst possible you can imagine, you know, where do you feel today? Well, you know, what's your level of fatigue? Do they have any pain? So just like taking all this into context and looking at the individual, some patients are actually not fit for the program. They're just too debilitated. So we do refer those patients and make the recommendation they go to physical therapy first or for patients, uh, lung cancer patients. You know, some of them do have that decreased reserve. Um, some have lost a lung or part of a lung, so they have diminished capacity. So they're more appropriate for pulmonary rehab, and we do make that referral. It's interesting because as I was sort of looking through the site, I was fascinated by not only sort of some of the physical um, uh, programs that you have, you know, that you guys offer, such as what you know you're talking about right now, but that mm -hmm. some of the symptoms um, are even outside of that when it comes to mm -hmm. stress, you know, distress, anxiety, and depression, sexual health. Smoking and tobacco. Right, use. we uncover a lot of things. <laughs> right, yeah, and it, it was really fascinating uh -huh. to me to see, and what, as I sort of got to thinking about it, whether it's um, numbness or or neuropathy or pain, um, right, that is a, a subsequent sort of side effect of the treatment. Weight gain, weight loss, spiritual loss, memory loss, mm -hmm. lack of support. You guys are sort of this one stop shop for mm -hmm. all of these things. And if I'm a patient, can you? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the why. Why should I consider something like this post-treatment? So what we find, is whatever um, visit we have, whether it's the oncology rehab visit, um, I think, we, you know, when we talked about a week ago, we talked about the service lines we have, and you've touched on those from cancer genetics, sexual health, um, our lifetime clinics, um, our lung, you know, smoking cessation. Um, so there's all these different things. So Either in our visit where they come or other visits, we're always the nurse practitioners, nurse navigators are always trying to assess, you know, you know, what's, you know, you're here for this vis visit, but there's, there's, is there one thing I can help you with today? So it may not be typically, you know, it may not be what they came for. They may come in severely distressed or have a lot of anxiety over the upcoming, you know, next scan, um, or maybe they just received another diagnosis, unfortunately. Re recurrence. So we, we, they're there, we address their needs when they're there. We also, are there things that we can touch on, you know, in that visit? And then we try to connect them to the appropriate resources. Okay. And that's what I was just going to ask. So no two visits are really the same, right? Because everybody right. sort of responds and reacts differently from a clinical standpoint, as well as a mental standpoint. So that's all part of the sort of assessment to gauge what the best sort of first step is into this integrative type support. Mm -hmm. We do have what's called the integrative oncology survivorship visit. So okay. that's our visit where we're trying to actually bring those patients in and see what their needs are. Um, we try to get patients usually on cycle one or two of treatment, but we're bringing them in. We're, we're, you know, showing them all the services that we have. We ask them what, you know, what are their needs? What do, what do they have anxiety about? They have issues with, um, paying their bills, transportation, um, just how can we help them? So we, we have patients come in. We try to get those um, auto-referred whenever there's a new um, care plan put in for the patient. So just fires that off to us. And so there's a lot of cold calling the patients. And you were referred for this. And, you know, people will say, you know, I don't really understand why. What is this visit? It's an extra visit. So usually after our schedulers or the nurse navigators talk to them and say, hey, we just want to bring you in, see what we can help you with. Usually they're in agreement, you know, I'm glad they're king. So sort of a triage, I guess, if you will, when you're, that, that survivorship visit, that first 
sort of visit is is a conversation it sounds like mm -hmm. um about where the patient is and then mm -hmm. whoever's exactly. responsible for that intake then triages them to to different um clinical care mm -hmm. teams can you talk a little bit about um social workers I mean, what role um, mm -hmm. do social workers play in this uh, arena? So we happen to have three um, very good social workers. One of our social workers um, is actually um, the director of our cancer support community. So you've probably heard of cancer support community. We were actually the first mm -hmm. in-hospital partner uh, about, I guess, seven, almost eight years ago. So um, our social worker, Carrie, is director of that. So she puts on... Um, gets all these uh, classes, educational classes for. She sets up a lot of our movement activities like the Tai Chi. We just had a, a gentleman talk about Qigong, bucket drumming, um, journaling. You know, she's in charge of all that. But she also does one-on-one -on -one counseling um, for patients. And then we have two other social workers. One we, is like our resource social workers. So they help us with transportation, um, uh, food, you know, if there's food insecurity with patients. And then we have another one that is the stress management coordinator. So, and they actually, those two roles kind of interchange. They actually cover each other. So for stress management, is that more of a counseling service? So typically, so we have it built into our electronic medical record that the patients are assessed in every office visit for distress. It's a distress inventory. Um, so many hospitals actually use it. So ours, if the if the patient actually scores a certain score, it fires a referral to the uh, inbox of the social worker. And so if they're actually in that office, it's like, oh, this patient's actually here. I can go and see them, check in on them. Um, and then also, well, if they're not in the office, then they usually will call them to follow up with them. You know, it could be just a brief you know, five minute call, the patient might have had some um, anxiety over something coming up or just had a fight with a family member or um, had issues with transportation and getting there or something. It just depends. But sometimes it's, um, you know, a, a, a bigger issue that they spend more time with the patient. And then also um, people, you can just refer to our social workers. We do have that referral in place as well to where if they come in and, you know, talk to the physician or nurse practitioner or the medical assistant, you know, and just tell them something they have, you know, that's going on, they can actually just send that referral straight to the social workers and they'll check in on them too. That's great. Um, one of the other things that I found intriguing and um, was your, the spiritual care. What does that look like? Is it an in-house mm -hmm. person or do you refer them out and have partnerships with different churches in the area? I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah, we're lucky. Um, so Chaplain Blake, we have a uh, chaplaincy. He's he's been with us. I want to say a little over a year now, if not a year and a half. Um, but we we actually work with Blake every day. So he actually goes out to the different offices. We have about nine different offices in our area, and um, so he kind of goes around. Um, and then also he has time um, in CIOS where he goes and visits with patients in our building. We have about two infusion suites in our building, so he'll see those as well. So, and then people can refer to Blake as well, the chaplain. So he'll call them up, you know, non-denominational and just speak with them out whatever they're interested in. So. So one of the, one of the statistics that, that you had shared with me earlier was that 9% of eligible patients are referred. Can you talk a little bit about the, the percentage only, of patients? Or, yeah. Go ahead. I believe it was only 9%, only about 9% of eligible patients are referred to for some type of rehabilitative service. So when I say rehabilitative service, it's more than just a oncology rehab. Um, you know, it's um, could be the sexual health visit. You know, it could be um, a physical therapy issue. It could be a psychosocial issue like counseling. It could be a cognitive, cognitive issue related to chemo or brain fog. Um, so whatever you lump in that rehabilitative, you know, service, yeah. only about 9% of patients are referred. And I think that's because mainly the primary oncologists there, you know, it's, it's not saying anything against them. It's just that they're focused on treating the patient and they're focused on, um, you know, just the medications, getting them through their treatments um, and 
you know, some are, are more tuned into the rehabilitative part and others are just kind of, you know, siloed <laughs> in there. So um, in that sense, it's like the patient, you want the patient to, if I could tell, you know, uh, some advice is just try to be your own patient advocate or be an advocate for the patient if you are a family member or loved one. So because there's so many that just could use some type of type of rehab and they just are not referred. Yeah, it really is a shame. And I kind of opened up and touched a little bit on the fact that, you know, your your physicians, um, your medical oncologists, your radiation oncologists, and, you know, so on and so forth are there to treat your disease. Um, and what mm-hmm. we're really talking about here is treating the rest of the person, right? All of these things we've already sort of mm-hmm. touched on fatigue, phys- physical weakness, sleepness, and, and right on down the uh, sleeplessness, and right on down the line. Um, I think. D- I think it's very important that our patient population understands that this is something that happens because I really don't think most patients even know that this is something that's available to them. You know, we get calls on our helpline mm, all the time, right. right, from patients say with one one having one or more of these challenges, and we're subsequently referring them out to resources in their in their community. So it really is unique um, um, for you all out there in South Carolina to have this type of integrative program right there in your cancer center. And I think it's important to let patients know, you know, that having this, we call it shared decision-making, but shared decision, and I'm sure people who watch the living room have heard me say it a million times, isn't necessarily just about your clinical treatment, but it's about your whole self treatment and having those conversations with your physicians because they are there to help you and to, to refer you off to services such as this. It's such an important thing nowadays, especially when we're talking about survivorship, because thankfully, you know, treatments in the last decade and a half have have come a long way for lung cancer patients, particularly in the area of targeted therapies and immunotherapies. So people are living longer, but living longer, which is fantastic, but living longer post-treatment doesn't come without its set of anxieties and, and actual physical side effects. So What was it, Susan, that got you to that mindset that this was something that you wanted to take on for yourself? Because I think a lot of people, just like they think, oh, I don't need a support group or I don't need to talk to anybody, also think I don't need any of this, you know, mind, body, spirit sort of piece of the pie, if you will. So how did you come to that mindset? Well, I started receiving the benefits without planning on it you know, because I walked into a yoga studio, even though, you know, at that point in my life, I was older and, you know, didn't fit that idea of who I thought did yoga. I still was curious enough to give it a shot. Um, and I started receiving benefits. Um, so then, um, I actually decided to become a yoga instructor at the age of 50 and, um, you know, was, was really interested and in, because I was a social worker and I worked in the world of trauma and um, I was really interested in the piece of yoga that is so powerful um, as it relates to the nervous system and shifting out of fight or flight and being in that place of of hypervigilance and fear and not being able to sleep and increased blood pressure and all of that and being able to shift out of that place after a trauma or sustained trauma and crisis into a rest and digest and like how does that work and can we really do that at will and the answer is yes we can um so for me um, and who I am in the world, my interest is bringing yoga to um, people who, like me, thought that yoga was not for them. Um, it's less about standing on your head, and it's more about managing stress so that you can fully show up in your life in a way that you want to. And you absolutely can after cancer. You absolutely can during treatment. And yoga is really helpful Um, particularly yoga for cancer is particularly helpful with managing um, lymphedema, with managing um, anxiety, with helping people um, during treatments um, to sort of stimulate the lymph system and move the toxins out of the body. So educating people about treatment and then 
um, what they can do to, to help support their body in doing what it naturally does. Um, and for me, it's really about not so much going somewhere, but learning about what I can do myself, not waiting for an appointment, not waiting for someone else, but really what can I be doing um, to help me manage my life and my my side effects and symptoms? I love that so much because so often when we're talking to patients who are going through treatments, one big thing that sort of a recurring theme is this loss of control. But what you're talking yes. about is taking back what you can control. You can't control the fact that you were diagnosed but you can control how you choose to deal with that. I want to talk a little bit, and you touched on it, but I want to dig a little bit more into, you know, when people think yoga, they do think we're standing on our heads or maybe we're in a hot room and people are stretching in all these weird poses. But how is yoga for cancer different? Like I said, you touched on it, but in particular, I'd like you to dig a little deeper on regulating the nervous system following trauma, why that's an important piece. Um, and then you talked a little bit about the lymphatic, I hate to use the word draining because it doesn't sound pleasant, but <laughs> talk a little bit about those right. two things. Sure, sure. And and Yoga for Cancer, um, the, the program that I was trained through was founded by a breast cancer um, patient who was also um, a yoga practitioner. And she noticed that, and her doctor also um, commented that she was managing treatment so much better than a lot of her peers. And he wanted to know why and what she was doing. And he said, keep doing it. And she said, well, I, I continue to practice yoga. And so um, that was sort of a wake up call for her to dig even, even deeper. And as Jason mentioned, yoga is evidence based. You know, there is um, there's a lot, a, a litany of research um, into the benefits of yoga for a lot of populations, but particularly for cancer um, patients and survivors. So she wanted to develop um Protocol isn't quite the word for it, but but um, a training for um, yoga professionals to um, be able to address the specific needs of cancer patients um, as it relates to treatment side effects, um, as it relates to social and emotional responses. And, you know, there are definitely some do's and don'ts as it relates to yoga for cancer. Um, so if I go in and, and teach at a studio, um, I might not, I wouldn't have the same considerations as I would for an oncology yoga class. And, and what that looks like are not doing forward bends, for example, and having the head, you know, be forward, um, because I don't know who might have brain metastasis or have had radiation in the brain. Um, or people that might have, you know, vertebrae fusions, things like that. So we're taking into account um, treatments, common treatments and side effects um, and just being more mindful of that. I, I love that, that that this yoga, this oncology specific yoga is super sensitive to the physical not just the emotional needs of those impacted by cancer, but the physical needs, like you said. Um, and quite often lung cancer patients, as you know, are dealing with distant metastases and, and quite often in the brain, sometimes in the bones. Um, so it could potentially pose um, an issue um, in trying to get into some of these poses. Are there props that patients use um, as part of this, as well as avoiding some of these poses? Are there different things that patients can do to help support their body during a yoga session? Definitely, definitely. And, you know, all, all patients, all yoga practitioners have different levels of mobility and different levels of strength when we're starting out and balance, et cetera. So we absolutely want to be supporting our body in the best way possible to get the benefit of the pose, you know. So um, we'll use blocks. Um, and, you know, during COVID teaching virtually, not everyone has yoga blocks sitting around. So what we find is um, using um, paper towel rolls um, work just as well. 
Um, so, you know, being able to share about, you know, using a blanket, using a pillow instead of a bolster, those sorts of things. Typical household items can be used as props as well. And again, it is to support the body. And, you know, I might say raise arms up. And, you know, if someone has a port or has lymphedema or, um, you know, is wearing a brace, et cetera, you know, arms up for them might be here. And so while I'm teaching a class, I'm going to note that, that go to your, your degree. And if one arm can go up, but the other can go only to the side, like a goalpost, then both are going to be there. Okay. Cause we want to be getting the benefit of both sides doing the same thing. Okay. So, um, it's those sorts of adjustments and sensitivity. Um, but I also want to, um, let you know, and, and what surprised me about learning, um, oncology yoga is that it doesn't necessarily mean it's just gentle yoga. So we're not just sitting around, um, we are moving and it could be that someone's mobility keeps them in a chair at first. Um, but we're still going to be moving the body in a way and, and attaching breath with movement um, so that we are stimulating cardiovascular, respiratory. Um, we'll do some lymphatic brushing, you know, along the arms and along the legs to um, stimulate the lymph system. And, um, you know, again, we're going to be matching our inhale and our exhale with different movements. And people start to feel warm, um, even if they're sitting still, right? So we're, we're trying to activate the body because as Jason shared, you know, the um, common knowledge is 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week for cancer patients as sort of the minimum, the standard. If my, if my math is correct, that's two and a half hours a week. And we want it to be moderate because we do want to be activating all these different systems in our body. Um, we don't want to just be sitting around. We want to be focusing on what can we do and go and do it. You know, so if it might be, I can walk a block. Great. I'm going to go out and I'm going to commit to doing that a couple of times a day to getting fresh air, to getting out in nature, et cetera. I think um, the the two and a half hour um, comment it resonates with me, and and I'm sure a lot of people out there. I mean, there's there's a lot of people who are not living with cancer or going through cancer treatment who don't get two and a half hours worth of exercise, you know, a, a week. And I'm I'm, you know, it makes me, it just makes me it makes me take pause, right? But when I hear you talk about the benefits and how something like like oncology yoga can help with anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, um, lymphedema, which you talked about, depression, potentially some digestive issues. You, you used some words that I want to kind of pause right here and ask you to kind of explain for those who may not be familiar. One is you said thoracotomy. And I know Bonnie, who most of you know, is, is my mom. Um, and she was treated for uh, stage 3B um, non-small cell adenocarcinoma back in 2004, also had a thoracotomy, and that's a big surgery that leaves behind some pretty, a pretty, pretty big scar and some pretty hefty, you know, sort of scar tissue. So, can you talk a little bit about what a thoracotomy is and what you went through because it is common, although not as common today, type of surgery. Sure. Well, and, and you're right. I mean, it's it's definitely um, a, a pretty significant surgery that um, you know I have like a half moon shape on my back. Um, and, you know, scar tissue has developed over the 24 years since, since surgery, um, which has impacted mobility, right? And so doing yoga um, and doing twists and, you know, um, keeping arms and shoulders moving is really important um, so that the, the scar tissue doesn't really solidify and uh, reduce mobility. And so it's also important that you not start something like yoga um, right after a major surgery like that. You know, we certainly find it with chest tube, um, you know, drain sites as well with um, lo lobectomy and wedge um, resection sites, um, you know, but 
we can still, there's still so much we can do. And I think that's one of the important parts is, you know, in, in my role in the lung cancer community, I get to encounter so many different people over the last decade who are out still living really vibrant lives. And it's important that we share um, our experiences with each other so that we aren't our own worst enemy in some ways so that we don't buy into, I can't do it because I only have one lung. I can't do it because I'm, I'm tired from, um, from chemo. Instead, what can I do and what would feel good to my body today? Knowing that, you know, our bodies are designed for, for health. The cancer is, is in our body, but it's not our body. And so what can we do to, to help support our bodies continue to live and um, fight and um, continue to bring, you know, movement and activity to, to our lives so that we can continue to do the things we want to do. That's great. I want to, I want to switch to Jason for it, for this next question. Uh, you touched on it a little bit. Uh, Susan, thank you. But I, I know that, um, Jason, you touched on it as well. And this is this lymphedema management. Can you, number one, tell us what is lymphedema? So um, so lymphedema management, we actually, um, in our department, only uh, see um, patients where their lymphedema is um, caused by cancer, some form or fashion. So and lymphedema, of course, is um, the buildup of uh, lymphatic fluid that is somehow, you know, there's a blockage in the lymph system and it cannot uh, drain properly. So they come and see our therapist. We see mainly breast cancer patients. We do see um, lower extremity and head and neck patients. Um, we see patients for not only lymphedema, but also for cording um, and um, range of motion issues. How do patients know if lymphedema is a problem for them? They may or may not know. So if it's early lymphedema, um, they may not actually realize they have it, or they may have a heavy um, sensation in one arm. One arm or limb may actually be a little bit larger than the other. Um, that could be um, visual, or actually you couldn't, you may not actually notice it unless you did a measurement um, that's performed by the uh, physical therapist. Um, but typically, if you have a heaviness or fullness sensation, um, that's a good indicator. Right. What I really hope everyone heard tonight is the positive impacts that yoga can have on your body and your and your anatomy and some of the things we do, didn't really touch on. We could we could and and will to Susan's earlier sort of teaser uh, be rolling um, some of this out um, through through go to for our patient and really our caregiver uh, community, but. It you know it positively impacts our not only our lymphatic system which we touched on quite a bit, um, our respiratory system which is oh so important to to lung cancer patients who um, you know especially those of whom who have had surgery and either had one or more lobes um, removed who might be suffering some from some sort of COPD or emphysema so we know that's a progressive disease and breathing becomes an issue there uh, it's a huge huge piece of this for lung cancer patients. One of the things we didn't talk about were uh, the musculoskeletal and really building bone um, um, piece to how yoga can help positively impact your body, nervous system, your endocrine system, your immune system, and your cardiovascular system. So those are all sort of pieces um, of your, your body and your anatomy that yoga can positively impact. So that's just a big takeaway. And to Susan's, again, I'm going to reiterate her earlier point, more to come on on a lot of that. Um, from a wellness perspective in general, uh, stay tuned for, to go to for that. I do want to shift to both of you now for the how behind finding this type of care. Like I said, how does someone go about finding an integrative center that provides these types of services? It's hard sometimes because um, like us, we're a destination clinic and we're, we're lucky that we have um, a lot of these services that were built by our director. Um, but, you know, you won't find those unless you're in like a larger you know, somewhere like Memorial Sloan Kettering or Duke or somewhere like that. But, um, you know, the you can go out and look and see um, what your local hospital has. Like we, if you go back to talking about the, um, Susan had mentioned the 
video. So like our hospital actually has something called Move Well, and they have hundreds of videos just free online for, for patients. Um, they can look up, but also um, just seeing what's in your area, you know, look into your local cancer societies who might have certain um, programs that they're holding, um, their um, cancer alliances. We have one here in South Carolina um, that are constantly um, doing educational opportunities for um, patients. Um, so they're out there. You just have to kind of, you know, get in there and look for them. That's great. Um, Susan, anything you want to add to that? Yes. I mean, aside from the physical um, outlets and ways of Im improving quality of life, you know, I, I would encourage folks to think about what brings them joy, um, what they value in their life, and um, commit to doing more of that. Um, cancer doesn't have to steal your present. It doesn't have to steal your future. Um, and, you know, for me, mindset came first before I then started looking for, um, for resources. So that's, that could be a whole other, a whole other, um, you know, episode, if you will, just really looking at what we tell ourselves about um, what our cancer diagnosis has meant, um, and then what we fill our days with, and just being very conscious to um, to choose and not just let um, fear or um, what other people think um, determine the quality of our lives. Um, sometimes that means we shut down the screen, that we we move away and get out in nature. That means that we don't talk about cancer with with our family for a weekend. You know that we get to decide how much of our life we want to focus on cancer and how much we don't. That we get back to gardening. That we you know do those things that bring us joy and um, continue to live vibrant lives. I mean, none of us know how much time we have. Um, so the goal is certainly to um, live with as much vitality as possible. And more and more lung cancer patients are doing just that. And I think sharing our experiences with each other helps to sort of lift everyone up to go, I hadn't thought, I haven't painted in a while. I would love to do that. You know, and um, just be having those conversations. I love that, and you speak so well to this, Susan. And I know you know you've been on both sides of this, not only as a, as a patient when you were when you were diagnosed at thirty two, but as an advocate. And you've been a champion for patients for so many years since then. So th your perspective always gives me gives me chills. It's really about um, you know taking back that sense of power at a time when you feel powerless and trying to find something in a day that you can control or have power over. And you, you mentioned gardening or, or, or hobbies, just get moving. And I think um, one of the things that we didn't touch on, but the three of us had discussed earlier on um, before this session was when your body is telling you, or you think your body's telling you, you need to lay down and rest, what you should probably at least try is the actual opposite, right? To get up and move. Um, um, and I think a lot of what we've talked about today has has touched on that. And it really does kind of boil back down to that getting your mindset in, in the right place to be able to do that, which not being a patient, but having talked to patients over the years is a real, real challenge for folks. And it sounds like some of the things we talked about today um, are really an introduction to the possibilities behind getting yourself in in the right mindset. And I certainly don't want anybody watching live or whoever may come back and watch post live to think that we are, you know, by any means saying that it's not okay to have a bad day because it is. Um, and I think it's expected. Um, what we're saying is try not to live in those bad days. Try not to recreate those bad days by focusing on what you can maybe no longer do but rather flipping that on its head and thinking about, well, what you can do. I might not be able to do this, but I can do this, right? And then that becomes sort of your new, um, 
your new mindset. And um, I just I, I just wanted to make sure to reiterate that we're not we're not insinuating that bad days aren't to come. Um, one, Susan touched on a couple of things, and and thank you, Jason, for for bringing up the Live Strong at the YMCA. Susan, you brought up um, Yoga for Cancer. There's also the American Cancer Society um, as a resource. Cancer alliances in your state, um, cancer societies in your county or state, um, and the Society for Integrative Oncology are all resources out there. And if you um, want information or access to some of these resources, I go to we're we're here to help you. Um, in any way that we can. So please don't hesitate to reach out to the to the helpline um, and ask questions and, and we'll be sure to point you in the right direction. Thank you to Jason and Susan, all of you watching live or post live, Peninsula TV behind the scenes, the go-to team for all of your support, especially Michelle Zay and Maureen Rigney, who have been helping to monitor, monitor the um, online uh, chat this evening. And then of course our supporters, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Crystal Meyer Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, it's always a tongue twister for me, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Lily, uh, Merck, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Huge shout out to all of you, uh, and we'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me will be family just wait and see